Unity Materials. In Unity, materials are used to give meshes or game objects a visual property. They determine how light interacts with the object, it determines the colors, and smooth or metallic areas. In this brief video, I'd like to share some of the tips and tricks of how to create great visuals and materials in Unity, and I'll show you how I'm using this in my own game. If you're not already subscribed, doing so is free and it helps out my channel a ton. I know a lot of people have been asking where the next grab pack update video is, and don't worry guys, I'm working on it, but I've just been very busy recently with my own projects. I also have a Discord server where you can get inside updates on my games and show off your own work. It's linked in the description if you want to join. And as always, if you need further help with anything in this video, you can leave a comment and I'll try my best to reply. And with that being said, let's get into the video. In Unity, a material is made up of many different maps or textures that all describe a different visual property. For example, this mossy stone material is made up of five maps and a color input. In this video, we will be going over most of the maps that a Unity material can use. Starting with the albedo map, also known as the base color. As the name suggests, this map is the main texture that the material will follow. For example, if we're making a brick material, our albedo might look like this. This is what it would look like if we put this albedo onto a default Unity material. But this still looks very plain. We can add some more detail with a normal map. Normal maps are purple tone textures, with each tone representing a different direction. They change how light interacts with the material, creating the illusion of raised areas on a flat surface. There's a lot of ways you can make normal maps, but the easiest way that I found was this website, which is linked in the description, called Normal Map Online. All you have to do is drop your texture in, and I like to check this box, which really cleans up the texture in my opinion. Then, to make sure you're only viewing the normal map, you can uncheck the other maps. Now, just play with the sliders until you are happy with the intensity. Once done, you can download the texture. Now our material looks a little bit better, but bricks aren't supposed to be shiny, so let's use a specular map. Specular maps are black and white textures, where the brighter the shade, the more light is reflected, and the darker, the less light is reflected. This can be used to create a lot of different effects. For this example, we will be using it to make each brick have a slightly different level of reflection to give the material more variation. To make the specular map, we can actually use the exact same website, but this time disable everything but specular. Then go over here and click on the right map, and now you can just adjust the sliders until you're happy with the textures. And when you are, you can go ahead and download it. To apply this map to our material, we actually need to change the shader type, since Unity's standard shader doesn't support this map. You can also now change the smoothness slider to achieve the look you want. And the next map we will add is called a height map or a displacement map. This is another black and white texture where white represents the highest areas and black represents the lowest. To make this texture, we can once again use the same website, but this time leave the normal and displacement active and select the displacement tab. Now you have to find a good balance between the contrast and blur. When you're done, Go ahead and download the texture. You will also now have access to an intensity slider for the height. Next, we'll add what's called an occlusion map, which decides what parts of a material are affected by ambient lighting and which are unaffected, which creates a soft shading effect built into the material. Back on the website, make sure ambient occlusion is enabled, and then select the occlusion tab. You can then adjust the sliders once again and then when you're ready, download the texture. You can also change the intensity with this slider. And now finally, we'll add one last map, which is the secondary normal map, usually used to add more detail when viewed from closer up. This map also has its own UV tiling options and an intensity slider. You can also tweak the color input. This is the material we started with, and just by adding a few maps, we now have this. 
There is one more map we haven't talked about yet, the metallic map. The metallic map is basically the same thing as the specular map, but the brighter the shade, the more metallic, and the darker, the less metallic. But we don't need to use one for this material. One thing that really sets the tone for your Unity scene is your lighting. Lighting in Unity has a few different options, being real-time lights, baked lights, and mixed lights. Each can bring a different visual style and create unique atmospheres. Today we'll be talking about the ups and downs of each, when to use them, and how to use them. Starting with the easiest to use, real-time lights. Real-time lights are the default option when creating a light source, and they're very easy to set up. Once you create your game object, it should already be working, but there are a few things you should do. If this light should always render, then change this to important. I do this for most lights. And then you have two different shadow options. Soft shadows look better, but are more demanding on the computer, especially if you have a lot of them. And hard shadows don't look quite as good, but are easier to render. You also have a shadow strength setting, light range, and light intensity. Here's an example of real-time lights being used in my game. My game is primarily using real-time lights right now, but this might change before release depending on the performance. Before we move on to baked lights, I just wanted to show you some tips on how to make your lighting look better in general. The way you do lighting is different depending on if you're lighting an outdoor scene or an interior only. For an outdoor scene, you want to have one direction light to act as the sunlight or moonlight. Mine has a bluish tone. You can also go into the lighting settings which can be opened through window, rendering, then lighting. Then select environment, and you can give your scene a little bit of environment lighting. This creates a little bit of ambient light, making the illusion of indirect lighting, which isn't possible with real-time lights. If you're making an interior scene, you want to have no directional lights and a completely black skybox also works well in my opinion, which can be made by creating a new material and changing the shader to a six-sided skybox and making it black. Then you can do the same thing as the outside and add some ambient lighting. And now, moving on to baked lights. Baked lights offer more realism with the addition of indirect lighting and better shadows, and they boost performance. But there are a few downsides, since they aren't real-time, they do not cast shadows or light up any non-static objects, and it can take a while to get a result based on how large your scene is. It also might take a while to get all the settings right for your game. I'll talk about some of the basic settings, some setup, and how to get real-time shadows with baked lighting. And if you're completely unfamiliar with what baked lights are, basically baked lights in Unity are pre-calculated lighting data that is stored in textures, also known as light maps. Instead of being calculated in real time, baked lights are calculated in advance and apply to static objects in the scene. This reduces the calculations at runtime, improving the performance. As an example, here is a simple scene I made using real time lighting, and the lighting doesn't look that great, so we're going to change it into baked lighting. First, I'll select all my point lights and change the mode to baked. Then we can half the intensity because we'll use a combination of baked and real time lights and we don't want the scene to be too bright. Then, let's increase the indirect multiplier to ensure there are no dark spots. Then go into the lighting tab and select scene. The first thing you will want to change is the baking device. Your two options will be your GPU or CPU. You want to choose whatever one is stronger, so this depends on your computer. I think for most computers, the GPU will be faster. Next, you have your indirect samples and direct samples, increasing these values improves quality but increases the bake time significantly. You also have min and max bounces for indirect lighting. This is just how many bounces are calculated, and this doesn't have to be very high, so I'm going to leave it at 1 and 2. Then down here you have the light map size. Depending on the size of your scene, you will want to increase this to capture more detail, but since this scene is small, I'm going to leave it here. And then finally, light map compression, which is the higher quality, the larger the required storage and memory, but this does make the light map slightly higher quality. You can also check off ambient occlusion, which looks better than the real-time ambient occlusion that we'll talk about later. These settings can be specific to your project, so it's best to play around with them all on a small scale scene, and then when you're happy with the output, bake your larger scenes. <laughs> 
The next step is to select all the objects you want to bake light onto and then set them all to static. And now you can click generate lighting and you should immediately see a progress bar in the bottom right of your screen. This can take longer depending on your lighting settings and the scale of your scene. When it's done, you can now see your generated lighting. This does look pretty good, but we can take it a step further with mixed lighting. Mixed lighting is the same as baked, but incorporates real-time shadows and light to non-static objects, basically acting as both types. Select all your point lights and set the mode to mixed. You can then go to the lighting settings and clear the baked data, and then rebake it. You'll notice the scene is a bit brighter, and if I were to move this pillar, the shadows are now in real time. Post-processing is a simple and effective way to greatly improve the visuals of your game. Post-processing is a collection of different effects or filters that can be applied to the camera. I won't be going into too much detail, but I will talk briefly about each effect and what it does. To access post-processing, select Window, Package Manager, and then switch to Unity Registry. You can then search for post-processing, and then click Install. Once done downloading, click on your camera and add the post-processing layer component. We will then set the mask to everything for now. Then turn on anti-aliasing, which gets rid of sharp and jagged edges on shapes. Now you can create a new 3D object post-process volume. This is essentially a 3D volume that applies effects to the camera when the camera is inside of it. But if we check is global, then the effects are now applied all the time, no matter what. Next, you can create a new profile to store your effects. The first effect we will talk about is ambient occlusion, which I mentioned earlier with the baked lighting. Ambient occlusion is a smooth shadowing when multiple surfaces are close together, like in the corners of the room. There are two different modes. Scalable Ambient Obscurance and Multiscale Volumetric Obscurance. Multiscale is a slightly more realistic approach to lighting. Next, let's talk about Auto Exposure. This effect is commonly used when you want your camera to simulate a real camera. When the scene is dark, it automatically adjusts the exposure to brighten it a bit, just like an actual camera. For example, with the right setup, if I move the camera into a dark room, it brightens slightly, and then when I move it back, it dims back down. Now onto Bloom. Bloom is a glowing effect that can be applied onto different materials. It can be adjusted with the intensity slider, and the threshold slider determines the level of emission a material must have to be affected. There is also an option for a dirt map overlay to achieve a cool camera lens effect. The next one is very simple, it's called Chromatic Aberration. Chromatic aberration is an effect where different colors of light don't focus at the same point, causing a slight color fringe around the edges of objects. This can be adjusted with an intensity slider and an optional texture for further customization. I find it best to keep this effect very subtle. Now, moving on to color grading. Color grading has a ton of options and settings to manipulate colors in your scene. The most notable are temperature and tint, post exposure, color filter, hue shift, and saturation and contrast. Post exposure brightens lights, which isn't very useful if you're already using auto exposure. Color filter adds a color on top of everything, hue shift changes the hues of each color, and I always like to use saturation and contrast to make my scene pop and look less bland. The next effect is depth of field. Depth of field controls the focusing point of the camera. You can adjust the focus distance which changes the distance from the camera that is in focus. The aperture and focal length both control the depth or shallowness of the focused area. You can also use this effect to completely blur the camera if needed. Then we have a very simple grain effect which adds a constantly changing noise overlay, which can be customized with an intensity slider and a size slider. There is not much use for this effect in my opinion because it is very easy to make a better one for a specific use. Let's add a lens distortion. 
Lens distortion creates a fisheye effect, where it bends or warps the image around the edge of the screen. You can scale the intensity and the axis of which the distortion takes place. You can also move the distortion point on the screen. To keep moving, next we have motion blur, which is exactly what it sounds like. You can adjust the shutter angle to create a more pronounced blur effect or a more subtle, and you can change the amount of samples for a higher quality blur at the cost of performance. The next effect is screen space reflections, which is a great alternative to real-time reflection probes, and it doesn't usually impact the performance as much, but also doesn't always look as good. To use this effect, you have to switch your render path to deferred, which can be done on the camera component. You have a quality preset for the resolution, the maximum march distance controls the distance of drawn reflections, and the distance fade can smoothly fade out reflections based on the distance from camera. The vignette darkens the edges of the reflective surface. Here is a comparison of real-time reflection probes and screen space reflections. The final effect is vignette, which is just a darkening around the edges of the screen. You can change the intensity the smoothness, the roundness, and the color. I use this effect in about every single project, but I keep it very subtle, and I think it can really tie everything together. Now, I know I didn't really go into much detail with the post-processing, because that could be definitely its own entire video, just because of how many options there are. But anyway, thanks for watching all the way to the end, remember to like and subscribe because this video took me a while to make. I hope you've learned something, or at least were entertained. And join the Discord, and keep an eye out for news on my game coming soon. I'll see you in the next one.